I'm the Reverend Terry Melvin, the president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists and the host of Labor Shift. Uh, I want to welcome you to our show tonight and ask all of you to, who are watching to stay to the end so we can go over our calendar for the week. Uh, we'll be having shows on Wednesday and Thursday with Vice President uh, Biden joining us Wednesday in the presence of the three of the largest public sector unions on Thursday. But one of our guests tonight has actually delayed a call to join us for the beginning of the show. And we don't wanna waste the time and opportunity to hear from him. On July 20th, SEIU members, fast food workers, other workers, those in the fight for 15 and a union are holding a national strike. Uh, they say that in this moment of national reckoning, working people from across the nation and allies in this interconnected fight for justice are standing together to strike for black lives. Now, for full disclosure, CBTU is signed on as a partner. It is something we believe in and something we truly support. To better explain this strike and to introduce our limited uh, speaker, I wanna turn to my brother and dear friend, Jerry Hudson. Jerry is not just a jack of all trades. He's truly a master of many. As secretary treasurer of one of the largest and most powerful unions in this country, SEIU, Jerry has a long history of being a change agent and a leader who goes where most won't. I've uh, been to the motherland with Jerry. So it is truth when I say this man is a true labor leader and visionary. Jerry is the one that I call the thinker in the movement. Jerry, thank you for being here with us. Uh, please let the people at home know about the July 20th event. So I'm, I'm not gonna take up a lot of your time talking about what July 20th is, because I've got two, two, two of my brothers on uh, to do that for me. Um, what I, I do want to do is, is to say something about both of them. One, Maurice Mitchell is now the executive director of the Working Families Party, but I first met him <laughs> as we were developing the, the beginnings of what has become Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and I, I want you to know that this brother um, has is is dear to me. Um, he is a piece of organizing a movement that most people didn't even quite see un until after George Floyd, and then there's this explosion. It's one of these things where most people are like, oh, oh. There's something out there. They heard a little bit about Black Lives Matter, but all of a sudden there's this big explosion. Well, there's some folks who've been organizing in the vineyard for a while to create that explosion. There's 150 local organizations that is a part of that network. And so I want Maurice, who was one of the architects of the building of that movement, to talk to you a little bit about that. And then the second piece of that is, is Travis Dupree, is our in our organizing department he's he's the person who essentially tries to knit our organizing program to movements on the outside um he's a kind of strategic partnership director for the organizing department and he's been traveling along with maurice and others in both building out seiu's relationship to uh movement for black lives but as well as pulling in the poor people's movement <laughs> to black lives matter these two brothers are dear to me these and so i think they are the best to kind of lay out what july 20th is um but i would like maurice to sort of lay out first who who, who black lives matter is um, and 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 what where it's thinking of going, and then have Travis come in and talk a little bit about what July twentieth is, if that works for you. It works for us, Maurice. Maurice, my brother, it's you, babe. <laughs> All right. Well, well, um, 
I want to thank I want to thank you thank you Jerry for that that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, Brother Terrence. Uh, thank you for for the time to to speak with you all. Um, so I I um, I address you on behalf of the Movement for Black Lives and the Working Families Party. And like Jerry said, in in August of 2014, I as well as a number of folks we're so inspired by the uprising in, uh, in St. Louis and in Ferguson and witness how it transformed all of our, our worlds. It certainly transformed my consciousness and I felt duty bound at the time to support and to uh, learn from and to be in relationship with and flank uh, many of the people on the ground in Ferguson and St. Louis, There's many young people, many folks of, of all stripes in the black community uh, that showed uncommon courage. And as we know, that wasn't just a momentary event. That what happened after the uprising in Ferguson is the movement for Black Lives sort of mushroomed into an international movement. And since then, um, you know, from from Ferguson to Baltimore to Charlotte to uh, you name it, um, there's been other uprisings. There's been, of course, as we know, as Black folks, um, state violence against Black folks is as old as our history here in North America. And uh, there, there are other instances of killings. And what we've always said is that our movement is not simply about ensuring that police no longer kill us in the streets. Our movement is about Black people thriving. And Black people carry all different types of identities. And so that person that is murdered in the streets by police, that person is also a worker. That person is also a mother or a father. We have all of these identities. And so to ensure that our Black lives matter, to ensure that Black people thrive, we have to have an intersectional approach. We have to have an approach that reaches into the labor movement. We have to have an approach that reaches into the environmental justice movement. We have to have an approach that reaches into the immigrant rights movement. Why? because we know rank and file laborers are, are black folks as well. We know that um, you know, a lot of the conversations in the American imagination about, about working class people is a white man in a hard hat in the Midwest. But we know the reality that the labor force is, is very diverse, includes people of all genders, and it is getting browner and blacker. Right. So when, when people talk about the labor movement, they're talking about a black movement. Mm -hmm. When people talk about the immigrant rights movement, they're talking about a black movement. When, when people talk about the environmental justice movement, they're talking about a black movement. And so the movement for black lives is a corrective in order to set the record straight, because we know in all of those movements, the protagonists throughout history that have led those movements have been black folks oftentimes working class black folks that have been forgotten, oftentimes working class black women that have been forgotten by history. And so this movement is a both a corrective to that and a declaration that after centuries, we're going to establish that black lives will matter. And if black lives matter, then we have to reckon with all the various ways. It's not simply, we're not satisfied with simply ensuring that we don't, we don't die like dogs in the street. We want human dignity and we want to thrive. And so in order to, to make that right, we, we need to ensure that we could organize in our workplaces, that we get a living wage, and that we get the human dignity and value that many middle-class white people uh, sort of take on without thinking twice. And so that's what this, this movement is really about with the horrific murder of George Floyd, the horrific murder of Breonna Taylor, uh, the horrific murders of, of many, many people in this in the past few months. For some people, this is the first time that they're reckoning with this. If you're black, you've been reckoning with this your entire life. And for those of us in this movement that have been working over the past uh, six to, to seven years on this particular new wave, it's just, a, uh, it's just a different wave of the long black freedom struggle. For us, what's happening is we're experiencing multiple storms at the same time. COVID-19, 13% of the population, 33% of the deaths, Black people, right? Um, you know, they say when America catches a cold, the black, black people catch a flu. That's literally happening right now, right? And on top of that, we know that we're uh, approaching, or we've already approached um, a depression level unemployment, 
And we know that black unemployment is generally somewhere near twice the median unemployment uh, in America. So the fact that we're experiencing depression level unemployment for every for everybody, what black people are experiencing is unlike anything we're experiencing economically. So, so there needs to be an economic front to this movement. There needs to be a rank and file working front to this movement. And so I couldn't be more pleased to be part of this conversation, to be joined by my brother, Travis, who I think is going to go into what that might mean uh, on the 20th. Uh, but this, the last thing I'll say is that um, the 20th, just like Juneteenth, when we had hundreds of actions, these are opportunities, these are particular moments, but we're in the first inning. So the, this, these are all organizing opportunities to galvanize us, to, to strengthen us so that we could be engaged in the long-term fight. This isn't going away. Um, we are encouraged and we're committed to the long-term fight for, for true structural change. Not, you know, we appreciate and the, the yellow, the, the yellow uh, street paint, that's beautiful, that's great, but that's, that's <laughs> not why we're in this fight. We're in this fight for structural change and building true independent black power. So I just wanna thank you all for the conversation and looking forward to hear what Travis has to say. But, but, but before you stop a little bit, say, say a little bit about the international piece of this. Because you, you should know that Terry and, and, and some of us have, have been involved in a conversation with, 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 with black trade unionists all over the Americas and in Europe and in Africa. So, mm. so say, say, say a, a tad about the international flavor of this and, and, and then we can go to Travis. Absolutely. That's such a good point. So, you know, early, early on in 2014 and 2015, um, we recognize the importance of, of internationalizing the struggle, right? And what we saw was the things that we would do in the US, our counterparts, our black counterparts on the continent of Africa, in Europe, in Latin America, would respond to the activity that we were that was taking place in the US. So we began to build relationships um, with black movements all around the world. You know, that's that's the other piece. Um, <laughs> You know, blackness is universal, right? <laughs> and and uh, what we're experiencing is global, just like um, white supremacy has a global face and the labor struggles that, that we're experiencing, racial capitalism has a global face. The black movement has a global face. And it, oh, historically, if you're a, a, hit, uh, if you're a student of, of the history of our black movements, we know that historically, you can name anybody from Malcolm, whoever ha has understood the inter international feature of our movements. And if we look right now, some of the largest uh, protests uh, in this moment have been in places like Germany, have been in places like Paris. And what they've done, they've certainly lifted up George Floyd and London. some of the folks in the US and London. They also <laughs> lift up the, the cases of police violence against black folks in their, in their communities. Right, because anti-black violence and state violence against black folks is universal. And this is, you know, there's there's something burgeoning in 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 Central America and Latin America as well, because our history, we understand that in the in the US, our history is one that's marred by the genocide of indigenous people and the enslavement and capture of African people. And we talk about ourselves, we think of ourselves as Americans. What we don't realize is that. Everybody in South America and North America are Americans. We're U.S. <laughs> citizens, and so the, the experience that we're experiencing of of the genocide of Indigenous people and the enslavement of African people, the foundational uh, sins of the United States, that's the foundational sin of the entire Americas. So wherever you go in the Americas, you will find people of African descent experiencing the same hell, the same type of hell that we're experiencing here. And so having that international connection, that Pan-African connection, that empowers us even further. There's, there's some of, th this is a, a active dialogue because there's, there's some folks who are, I think are taking a reductive approach and, are, and only think about blackness in the context of the United States. And I think this is an opportunity for us to expand our horizon and, and start making those relationships with folks on the continent. We have comrades in South Africa we can learn so much from. Right, we're experiencing state capture where corporations are capturing our government. They're experiencing state capture too in South Africa. You know, uh, 
in, in Brazil, Brazil has, has the largest black population outside of the African continent. They're exp experiencing police uh, murder at an alarming rate. I was in Brazil a few months with, with, uh, with a community of black folks all across Brazil who are trying to figure out how to build black power. We need to be in dialogue with these folks and we have an opportunity right now where this movement is international in its character and it's also multiracial in its character because what we see on the streets is, um, is, is people across generations and people across race under black leadership. This is something that this country has feared from jump. And so we're in a position right now to truly transform things, um, both the multiracial and international character of this movement. Thanks, Travis. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you, Brother Melvin. Um, you know, Jerry, my my, I can't say enough. My mentor. Um, I'll start by saying I say the same thing when I'm ever in the same room or places. Maurice, protect Maurice Mitchell at all costs. Um, <laughs> brother, you know, I have your back. Um, I can't say enough about Mo. Um, you know, the easiest thing to say is we're in an interesting time, right? I think about when I first was brought to, to Maurice, um, he had been sitting and like, like putting together this group of black and brown women and men for this very moment. Um, I appreciate the foresight of our leaders in this, in this moment to know that this time was coming and for us to be prepared for it. Um, when the rising majority, which is a coalition of 80 some organizations led by black and brown women and men who have been coming together on a on a regular basis, talking about you know this moment coming, but I couldn't see. I didn't see labor's position, right? I sat at these meetings and didn't know where I fed in personally, where labor showed up, and Maurice and others saw um, the need to have a cross sector coalition, right? And there's it, it's it's amazing how this moment has come and how folk have been ready for it, right? Um, you know when the pandemic hit. Um, it became very evident how this country and corporations feel about black and brown people. Um, low wage workers all of a sudden became essential workers, right? A lot of us in the labor movement. And as we see the sickness and the death toll kind of build, you know, we all watch the, like, we're watching news and you see the numbers go up, right? I remember it was like 400 deaths. I remember sitting watching my family, 400 deaths and the numbers build and nothing being done for our people. And once again, as Mo said, you know, it's saying like when, when white people get a, get a cold, we get the flu and nothing was being done. And then hearing stories of workers that were being forced to go to chicken processing plants, fast food restaurants, nursing homes, hospitals without protection and going home to their families and just hearing the despair um, in their voices on a daily basis. We had these conversations for hours. Um, and, and prior to the pandemic, you know, SAU have been planning, a, we've been doing a protect all workers campaign. So we were going to do strike for all workers anyway on July 1. That already been planned and we canceled it, obviously. And fortunately for us, we're lockstep with the Movement for Black Lives, with the rising majority. And, 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 and on a daily basis, I ask, how can we show up? How can we show up and do something? You know, our workers are hurting, Black folk are hurting everywhere. How do we show up? And they said, you know, step up and bring your friends along. You, SEIU, and other labor folk need to show up for the movement. Um, so I was proud under, under Jerry's leadership that it was a no brainer. We went to leadership and they said, do what you need to do. We need to do this. This is our movement. We need to lead. We need to be inclusive in this moment. So that's kind of where Strike for Black Lives came from. And we've been doing it. It's only been a couple of weeks. We've never done this type of mobilization in this short period of time. But with the help of organizations like y'all, like every group that we reached out to said, what can we do? Um, I'm, I feel bad because I haven't reached out to enough folks. Like I can't get to everyone. <laughs> right? I can't get to everyone. Like everyone is saying, what can we do? Um, I'm so proud to have such depth of black leadership in this country. You know, like I don't think we can let that slide. Like folk are really, really to, to lay it all on the line for our people. So I'm very, very proud to be a part um, of the movement and for July 20th, where we're gonna have strikes led by workers in various industries in 25 cities or more in this country and then other places around the world where workers are literally striking um, 
in such a dangerous in such dangerous conditions, right? Like this is an extremely dangerous time. Mo and I were together in DC on Juneteenth, and people are in the streets. So that just tells you the despair, the anger, the fortitude, the resolution that our people have in this moment. Um, it's great to have allyship, you know, but at the end of the day, we have to make it happen, right? Um, so July 20th is gonna be amazing, really. Um, and cross-sectorally, like, like people are stepping up, whether it's the climate justice folk that are gonna be in the streets in Flint, Michigan, whether it's gonna be nursing home uh, workers fighting on the streets in Chicago, fast food workers in Oakland, um, and then folks that aren't even in our orbit that are signed up to do their own show. You know, um, I can't say enough of what can happen when um, we have proper leadership as I'm facing you all here. Um, and then it's the will of the people. Um, you know, we're talking earlier, like this, this, this is not a moment. It literally is a movement. Um, and I'm confident that it's not gonna be temporary, right? Like this is leadership and organization is working. Um, conversations like this help us connect. And, and we're saying like, this is just, I'm a continuation from Juneteenth, you know, and we're folks are already talking about how do we organize after July 20th? Like we're connecting and, you know, Mo and I do a lot of work nationally, but the real movement is on the ground in these cities, you know, where people are like, our organizations are connected in Minneapolis, in Seattle, Washington, in Richmond, Virginia, in, like all over the country. We're just helping, we're just conduits, right? Helping people connect and let them do their thing. Um, you know, I know we talked about the divest, invest, we touched on it. Um, I think the biggest piece of that, and I don't know if more have time, is folks are demanding a seat at the table. Um, and even more importantly, we're creating our own tables now. Even more importantly, like we're, we're going to force this conversation to be had. And it's just not about the police, right? It's just not about corporations. The whole system has been broken and it's not been broken. It was never set up for us, right? So to get back to July 20th, we will be in the streets all day July 20th. Um, um, we have offered people to come as they are. And that's, what, that's what's so amazing about the movement for Black Lives. When I went to them and said, how do we show up? They say, show up as you are. Show up as you are. And I went to Jerry and Jerry, what did you say? Jerry said, we're, we're not necessarily a racial justice organization, but it kind of is one and the same, like Mo touched on. You know, without economic justice, there is no, no way we can have racial justice. And I'm just proud to be a small part um, of bringing people together. And on July 20th, I think we really want to show, um, and it's a, it's a phrase I stole from a colleague, it's a pathway to power. Because you're going to see it on July 20th, and then we're going to be planning and organizing on July 21st. <laughs> right? Good. So, so, you know, we love for anyone to show up. You can go to uh, J2020, J20 Strike for Black Lives.org, and, and show up as you can, whether you send a tweet, whether you call an uncle and watch a live stream, but just know that this movement is bigger than a day. Um, it's bigger than any organization. No one cares who gets the credit. And I know we're labor here, like that's been an issue in the past. No one cares who gets the credit, but we're All demanding. All hands, no elbows. Yep, that's the, I'm gonna, <laughs> like, we're literally, like this train is moving. Um, we don't have one or two leaders. We have a whole lot of leaders, a whole lot of leaders of all ages, sizes, genders, whatever. We have it all. And it's just great to be a small part and to watch this train rolling. Watch this train rolling. So on July 20th, we're gonna be in the streets safely as possible. And then on July 21st, we're gonna be right back at it organizing for the next thing, right for the next thing. But I just wanna say, like, I appreciate y'all for all y'all have done and all y'all continue to do. And um, like I talked to my brother Fareed earlier, like it's all about connecting. Each day I wanna meet someone else that I can and I can connect to someone else. And we're gonna keep building. If this system was created, what, 400 years ago, we're not gonna fix it in 400 days, but we're gonna to touch each other, lift each other up, support each other in our communities, right? Like it starts in our communities and we building it out. So I'm just excited to be a part of this. Thanks for this conversation. Um, yeah, I'm ready to answer any questions or, or, or move forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Travis. I, I, I mean, I'm inspired by the, uh, the fact that the one point that you really pushed in, which is uh, this is bigger than a day uh, because I'm one of those folks that we were talking about earlier before we went live uh, that I'm, I'm tired of marching just for uh, a march, uh, but clearly uh, this is a movement and not a moment. And we've got to embrace this movement uh, that is going on. And all, uh, as, as Jerry said, we all gotta be in it uh, to make change at this time. Let me um, 
uh, thank Maurice for stopping by and uh, we appreciate the time that you took to speak with us. We know that you have to run, but it's, I thought it was important that we hear uh, the message and push the message out that both uh, Maurice and Travis uh, talked about. Uh, Maurice talking about the Black Lives Matter movement and, and how it is not just uh, uh, here in the United States, but it is a global movement. And we see this when we leave uh, these here United States of America. Sometimes we seem to think that uh, we know it all and we got all the answers. Uh, and we find out that a lot of the same issues are going on cross borders as it relates to black people uh, that are on this globe. So it is uh, heartening to know that uh, we have a movement uh, that is really taking off now. Uh, and, uh, and I'm all in, uh, we're all in at CBTU. Uh, we'll do whatever we can. I've had a couple uh, international presidents call me and say, what can they do? Uh, and we're working with them to make sure that they have uh, ample opportunity. Uh, but if Travis, if you could talk just one moment about, uh, we talk about the strike and getting out on the streets and doing the rallies, but there's some folks that can't leave their job on that day. Uh, what advice are, are we giving for those folks to show their support uh, for the strike on the 20th? That's a great question. Thank you. So various things. Um, there's some people that can leave their jobs and don't feel safe in the street, right? Um, so we're, so one thing that um, some of our leaders wanted to do that can leave their jobs are taking a knee or a moment of silence for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Um, some people are tweeting leading up to the, you know, to the event. Some people are uh, signing on to the website, just saying that they want to be connected moving forward. Um, so on that day, I, once again, I would say suggest, just look at the website, but just have your voice heard, right? Like tell some else about the strike. But on that particular day, I would say, if you can do something for eight minutes, 46 seconds, we'd appreciate it. If you can send a video, a 30 second video or 10 seconds, why this matters to you, you know, um, we um, would be appreciated. Um, there will be a live stream opportunity. I think it will be three o'clock on the 20th, where you can actually watch some of the activity happening. Um, but there's there's various levels of, of activity. So one will be literal strikes in the street. Then we'll have some caravans and some activity. We have some art installation. And then, you know, on a lighter level, you can watch it online. You can send, uh, get involved social media wise. Or like I said, just send a video or a thank you to, to someone or call up uh, your local pilot elected and tell them that, that this is important to you. So once again, we're not asking everyone to come to the streets. It's not safe everywhere, but we just want to make sure to be folks that are paying attention and sign up with a part of the organization just so you get information rolling, just so you know and you can you'll know what's happening moving forward. Thanks, thanks so much. Uh, well, this episode is entitled "Fear of the Black Worker." It was inspired by old dog description in *Menace of Society*: uh, America's nightmare, young black and just don't give up. What? Well, I'm not gonna cuss on live stream. Uh, I'll do it for you. Don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Uh, <laughs> we we picked this because of the upcoming strike on the 20th, but also because of the sincere fact that America is truly afraid of the black worker. They were scared of our rebellious uh, when we were uh, slaves. They were scared of our sit-ins when we were customers and were afraid of our strikes when we were workers. The black worker organized and mobilized is truly one of the scariest things in this nation uh, to the nation's elite. Uh, this leads us to the heart of the show today, which is about the power of the black worker. Uh, Maurice covered and uh, Travis covered the strike for us, but I feel there's a few more questions to ask to try to find some answers. I'm joined tonight by uh, two other people, uh, who have made a career leading social, political, and union change. Uh, we heard a little bit from Travis Dupree from SEIU. He's a national partner coordinator, as Jerry uh, introduced him. Uh, he's been around for a while, doing some good work. Uh, he and I are both here with sister uh, and political savant, uh, Petey Talley. Petey comes from ASME, but recently hung up her hat as secretary treasurer of the Ohio State Fed. But in truth, my season, sister, uh, we never really allow anyone to retire. Uh, we weren't going to let her go away that easily. There ain't no retirement uh, from the movement. Right? Not at all. 
has been commissioned to lead CBTU civic engagement program and to help us uh, make sure from the top down, we elect new politicians into power that actually work for us and not against us. So I wanna thank Petey for being here. Um, let me uh, uh, ask a little bit, um, I guess we can go to uh, Petey. Um, I remember the polls told us uh, that Hillary was gonna be the winner, hands down, and that was wrong. Uh, we live with the consequences of that moment for four painful, embarrassing, and horribly dangerous years. Uh, in my eyes, this election is critical, but what? But when I uh, talk to young folks, the best I get is they're voting unenthusiastically. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had a show two weeks ago and had some young people on, and, and that was basically the end. I mean, they knew they had to, these, these were active young folks. Uh, they knew they had to vote. Uh, they knew that they had to vote for um, Biden, but they really weren't all that excited. So, uh, Petey, why does this vote matter? Why do people need to get out this year in 2020 uh, to vote? Oh, thank you. Thank you, President Melvin. Let me just say thank you for the, this series of conversations. I want to also acknowledge uh, you and your capacity as leader of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists and your role as the Secretary Treasurer of the New York Federation, um, a, a, a title we both share. Um, also want to kind of tip my hat to another brother, uh, Brother Jerry Hudson, who has been, um, as you say, uh, President Melvin, um, the um, of the movement, um, who really takes us deep into um, the why we are here and what we need to do to kind of get out of the jams that we are in, and certainly want to uh, acknowledge the two brothers who gave us that wonderful um, uh, background about the movement for Black Lives, and certainly I. I, I excited about this uh, July 20th mobilization. And all, all of the other activity that has been happening in the street um, has been inspiring um, to those of us who've been around for a long time and who have been waiting for this kind of ignition to happen in our movement to get um, people moving and understanding that Black lives do in fact matter and that we can't be a successful nation um, if we are continuing to operate as we have been, um, leaving Black folks in the margins. And so I, um, I'm grateful for this awakening. Um, but I also understand that as we awaken behind a, a pandemic that has disproportionately impacted Black people um, and is killing us, literally killing us, um, and that we have a leader in the White House who is not concerned about the lives that are being lost um, as a result of the, black, uh, the pandemic, but now we have the um, the awakening that we are having on the street around um, police reform and the killing of black men um, and seeing all of this activity churning that has been churning since the pandemic. And um, we have a census that's happening this year. Um, voting matters even more so this year because as we are exercising um, our voice around um, the tearing down of structural racism, somewhere in that tearing down is um, the pathway to that tearing down of structural racism is in our ability to be able to participate in the democracy. The democracy is, has been there forever and we have as a people um, participated when it, when it matters most, but oftentimes we are on the sideline because we're not enthused by the candidates who may be on the ballot. Um, your show a couple weeks ago had these young people who were not necessarily enthused about uh, the presumptive nominee to run against um, um, President Trump. But I say that voting matters because it is really thought to be the one day where it doesn't even matter 
whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're young, whether you're old. It doesn't matter what zip code you live in. It doesn't matter what school you went to or what your family or what family you come from. It is the one day voting is said to be the great equalizer. And if we who are um, can make the difference in the outcome of elections, if we don't take the opportunity uh, to weigh in um, and uh, register who should be holding office, whether it's at the local, state, or national level, then we are giving a nod to whoever gets elected and saying, okay, you got elected without my vote. And therefore you have in fact made a decision about who should be holding that office. And so voting matters just for the simple fact that if you don't exercise your right to vote, you are in fact voting for whoever gets into office. And so it's incumbent upon us as a people, as we are fighting for our existence and the tearing down of these racial institutions, uh, the institution of racism in this country, that the path, I think uh, it was uh, either Maurice or Travis who said the pathway to power is through the economic lane, but it is also through the voting lane. Our power is also in the vote. And so we have to be doing both at the same time. If we're gonna have real transformation, that is how it's gonna happen. So when the protest kind of starts to kind of land down on the ground and you talked about, we'll, you know, we're gonna do this on July the 20th and we don't know what the next mobilization will be. I would hope that it's going to be mobilizing toward November so that we can, in fact, um, play a real critical role in the outcome of this election. Well, let, let me uh, let me follow up, do a follow up on that. And this is for um, Travis and Jerry or, or Petey, whoever wants to go in. I mean, how do we how do we make that connection? I mean, we spent the first 20 minutes of the show today talking about, you know, the Black Lives Matter. And we talked about the 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 twentieth the event on the twentieth the strike on the twentieth how do we make the connection and now we're talking about the importance of voting in November how do we make the connection for particularly the young black folks uh, that's out there to make the connection between we want to make change we got to get to the polls to do that how do we make that tra transition how do we make that connection I, whoever wants to jump in on that. You know, I would just say, and I'll defer to some of the other speakers. For me, the experience is that we have to be mobilizing, vote, we have to be politically mobilizing and organizing on the ground. And sometimes there's a disconnect um, when it comes to what we, what we should be doing and what is happening on the ground. Young folks are on the ground, they're on social media, um, but we're not always talking to them and always having that conversation with them about the value of their vote um, or their, the value of their participation in our democracy. Um, when we do, do, and then when we do have the conversation with them, sometimes it seems irrelevant, right? Because we're talking about, you know, maybe what Dr. King did or, you know, 50, 40 years ago or 50 years ago. And I think we have to make the movement relevant to where people are today. And, and one of the things that we know could happen and has been happening in a couple of places like Chicago and in Cleveland, when we talk about justice, I think young people get the whole justice thing, right? And so when we talk about justice in the killing of uh, Brillo, uh, the Brillo decision in Cleveland, where the the the, the prosecutor in that, oh, I'm sorry, trade my mark, the prosecute uh, uh, the prosecutor. Tamar, Tamir Rice, the prosecutor did not bring charges against the police officer. Well, when it was time for that prosecutor to get stand for reelection, folks said, no, we're not going to reelect you. And so taking something like injustice that young people get and tying it to what can happen when they exercise their power electorally is one way that I think we can get the connection. And so we have to look for those kinds of opportunities 
those kinds of races um, that we can plug young people into and, um, and get them to understand that their vote really does matter and can make change. And so we voted out a prosecutor in Cleveland that year. We voted out a prosecutor in Chicago. And I think that's one way I think that we can get the message uh, to young people. And obviously doing other things like eradicating student debt or something that is, you know, uh, paramount on the minds of young people could in fact make the difference. It's the issues that the candidates will fight for, I think that couldn't matter. And we've got to be talking about those. Thank you. Travis? Um, yeah, I, I want to second something that, that Sister Tally said. First, young people are so, so much further along um, with these issues than I was. Um, they understand that our elected officials have a direct impact <laughs> on their lives, right? whether it's dealing with the police, whether it's student debt, whether it's raising wages, whether it's healthcare. Um, and I think this election is gonna be different from the conversations I've had. Like they're looking at legislation that they want changed leading to these elections, right? Not who they like the most, like they're looking at actual legislation that they wanna put forth um, as, they, as they think about who they wanna vote for. Um, they're gonna lead. Like, I was on the phone with folks from the Future Coalition that are 18, 19 years old that are that are committing that they're going to vote. They're going to bring their parents to vote. They're going to make sure their grandparents are going to vote, right? Like they're going to take them there. Um, some folk at various jobs are talking about taking a day off, like talking to their bosses about that being a day off, so they can go vote. So I think that I think the desperation is is leading them to know that they have to do something, and voting is 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 a primary way to make actual change fairly immediately. But I think they're also making sure that they're holding the, holding politicians accountable before they vote for them. And they have, they're have they making a plan that's very important to hold them accountable after they vote for them. Because they know that politicians show up in our communities all the time leading up to the election. And then we vote them in and we don't see them anymore. So these folks are, we're putting together committees right now that are planning on figuring out who we vote for and then how we hold them, how do we hold them accountable after the election? So for the first time in a long time, I am optimistic. Um, um, the organizing is happening. You know, folk like Maurice, we have, a, we have an executive director <laughs> at Working Families Party, right? That comes out of the Movement for Black Lives who's been doing this organizing since Michael Brown, right? So, so that those people that were 17 to 18 then <laughs> are 24 now <laughs> and they've been prepared for this moment. So I, I think we're gonna shock some people. I really do. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Jerry, I just want to throw this. I, I know you don't want to uh, do a lot today, but uh, on, not on the program anyway. But you, you have, <laughs> I mean, you have a history of surrounding yourself, which is something that I, I've always looked up to you for. You, you have a history of surrounding yourself with young people, while others in the movement have shunned away young people. I have watched throughout the time that that you and I have known each other well over twenty years that you have always brought young people to the table. So what, what are you hearing from the young people that you're dealing with uh, on a daily basis about this issue? Uh, one, that, that voting for Biden ain't enough. Being anti-Trump ain't enough. It's, it, 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 for them, the question is, how is my participation going to reshape the politics of the country, right? Um, and, and, and if we can't give answers to those kinds of questions, then people just kind of drift away. Um, for me, what the movement for Black Lives and 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 I would say the Dreamers movement and a whole lot of the other movements that I've kind of associated myself with is saying to Black and Brown folks, one, th th there's a rising majority out there. Um, the Republicans can't keep power unless they figure out how to suppress the vote of those folks. And some part of the suppression is, it, 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 is to make the voting about nothing, really. And, 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 and they're saying, and what I've said back to them is basically, 
then make the vote about what you think your life is worth, right? It, it, it's it, it's a, a key piece of this thing. Um, somewhere underlying this is, 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 is the voting has to be about the things that matter to our community. Um, if it isn't, then people kind of drift away. If, 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 if it is, then, then they stay in it. Um, and so for, for me, look, Democrats have never, ever, ever won the presidency ever with a majority of the white vote. has never, right? Which means that if in fact the next Democrat wins, they need to not just worry about how to pull some piece of the white vote to them, but they need to figure out how to maximize the participation of people of color in this vote. And if they're gonna maximize it, then, then, then the voting has to be about their lives. It's got to be about immigration reform. It's got to be about, you know, police violence in our community. It's got to be about creating jobs. It's got to be about the things that really kind of matter to our folks or we don't win. And so for, for me, the, B B Biden can be whatever Biden is. Um, I think we shape what a Biden presidency is by the deep kind of electoral mobilizations that we do on the ground, uh, an electoral mobilization that is not just, I support you, but I support you because this is what I want. This is what I want. And, and Jerry, in other, in, in, and in doing that, it really does take infrastructure on the ground in our communities, especially black and brown communities to really continue. I mean, we've got literally four and a half months to, to, to kind of uh, build that kind of um, mobilization narrative that is going to take. And in order to do that, the resources that it takes to do that, because we, we're in a time of COVID. So um, we barely get resource to do the traditional tactics that it takes to mobilize a narrative that you just laid out. And now we have to do it even more so in a virtual digital environment because of COVID-19. And, and the investment will get there, but you know, I hope it doesn't arrive too late. Well, we, you know, I think it, it's incumbent of us to um, figure out, you know, uh, how we're going to do this relational organizing model um, that is kind of the uh, to do for 2020, and that's you know, uh, emailing and texting voters who are already in our immediate reach. Um, because you we got it, you got it. Number, we have their email address, um, and we have got to get savvy on these mobilization tools. But it is hard to get savvy um, because the investment to use those uh, to using those tools is still going to primarily white progressive organizations, and those of us who are out here in the black community are are, are having to knock down the door and make a case to the progressive community that we need some resources too so that we can do the social media digital ad buys that are gonna be relevant to the voters that, that, that we need to reach. Um, we have to do that so that we can do that with our warm contacts, with our fa friends, family, and people that we know. And then after we do that, then we have to use those same tools to go after cold contacts, which are voters that we target based on them being similar to our friends and family. And, and it's, a, it's a lift and, and time is running out and short. Uh, I knew we were all at the same starting point when COVID hit, everybody had to figure out how to talk to people in a contactless environment. But I'm afraid that um, if we uh, are, these investments are not made um, in the black, political organizing career, uh, arena, 
we're going to get left behind again because the tools that it takes, you got to train up people so that they know how to use the tools so that they can reach these people, uh, the people that we need to reach in a relational kind of way. And that's what we've been um, kind of noticing um, uh, in terms of what we need to do through CBTU. We're actually tooling up right now so that we can be a, a source of that mobilization the way it needs to take place so people can hear that narrative that you just described. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the issue of the connection that I was talking about is a connection that I'm thinking that we thread not just to um, uh, November election, but through November election. Uh, Travis talked about uh, these folks are looking for legislation, not just electing people, but getting something done by electing these people. And I think the, the, the fallacy that we've had uh, over the years uh, in the labor movement and other progressive is we elect folks and then we leave them. And, you know, we, we go back to them just before the next election to figure out what they didn't do for us rather than holding them accountable and passing legislation that we asked for before we decided to support them. So I, if we can make this, uh, take this movement and keep moving it higher versus uh, being satisfied uh, with where we are uh, and, and one victory, uh, then I think it, it will be all worth it in the end. Uh, so how do we, how do we, um, how do we memorialize this? How do we, how do we keep this whole thing going um, past uh, November 3rd? Uh, no matter, you know, because my position is, even though I believe in my heart and soul that we need to change the, the occupant of the White House, I, I, I think that the, that the mission uh, that is being laid out by Black Lives Matter and other progressives that are coming forward right now ought not be just a November 3rd mission. It ought to be a, a mission to change the systematic racism within our society. So how do we keep that moving uh, going forward, Travis? I, I think one of the things is ensuring that we're having conversations amongst ourselves to, know that, to, to commit to each other, that we're all in this together. You know, the movement is very broad, right? So we can't, um, push away our, our folks in the, in a, uh, that are fighting for immigration, right? Our folks that are fighting for climate. Like th what this situation has created for us is a very clear line in the sand. You can only be on one of two sides, right? And we have a lot of folk on our side, but we can't do everything at once. So we can commit to each other that this movement is gonna slowly um, uh, get progress, right? We're gonna get slow wins, like nothing happens overnight. Slow wins and your, your uh, priority might not happen in this first wave of legislation, but we will work together to get in the second wave and honor our commitments, right? Have the tough internal conversations, right? Like we'll come together for the election, then we'll go away. We have to have some tough internal conversations on how we can work together. Um, I also say that um, Ms. Talley touched on it, like organizing takes money, right? It, it costs money and organizations typically give you money when it's time for an election because they want to turn on our vote. Um, what the Movement for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter has been able to do to get, I'm hoping, start to get a build their coffers that after the election, we can continue to organize and continue to have Zoom meetings with partners all over the world. And when we get back in the street, we can start coming together in person and meet. Um, so I just think the commitment um, and, and, and the resolve to, to, to not just get a few wins, but to win, to, to change the system, right? Like we have to commit to change the system. And it gets hard when we're fighting for crumbs when it comes to the money, you know? Um, I, I think that's changing. Organizations are seeing the value in what our community can bring to the table as, a, as it relates to organizing. And I just think that as long as we keep committed to each other and being willing to have tough conversations amongst ourselves, and we see some of those small victories, right? Legislation is changing now, right? Like politicians are being forced to, to change stuff, to write legislation that, that, that speaks to our people. I think we can keep the momentum. Um, but like you said, like it's, I think it'll be a, We'll get the election, and however it turns out, there will be a big, uh, a big uh, meeting of the minds afterwards on what we need to do to go forward. So I'm just confident that folks that we have the we have enough depth 
that we can keep the movement going um, through the election and, and beyond. Thank you so much. Uh, before we uh, go to close, because uh, th this hour flies by every time we do this um, uh, this show, I'm, I'm amazed at how quickly 60 minutes goes by. But earlier, Travis, you said one of your personal issues was that you could not contact everybody you wanted to contact. Well, let me give you this opportunity right now before I close for those people who are watching that you have not been able to contact how can they get in contact with you to be a part of what we're doing on the 20th and going forward? Thank you. So I'll give you my personal email. It is travis.dupree at seiu.org. Or you can go to j20strikeforblacklives.org. Or you can go to infobl.org. Like the good thing is we're all in this together. Um, um, so just reach out to me or to any organization that's in the movement and we're connected. I just tell people to be part of something, right? You don't mean to take the streets, but sign up for any organization that, that speaks to your heart and we're coming together. So thank you so much for this opportunity. This is amazing, actually amazing. And I look forward to us connecting through July 20th and way beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, our time has finally come to a close. I wanted to thank my guests. Let me thank Maurice who was on earlier. Uh, thank uh, Jerry, uh, Petey, and Travis. I, I really appreciate you all taking the time to be here with us today. Uh, as I said at the start, uh, this is a busy week for us. Uh, on tomorrow, uh, from 6.30 to 9.30, we will have our Blacks for Biden webcast, and we'll be joined by both uh, Vice President Joe Biden and AFSCME President uh, Lee Saunders. In addition uh, to them, we will have some leaders and workers discussing why they support Joe uh, in 2020 and why they're getting out to vote in 2020. On Thursday, we'll be hosting a Heroes Act Town Hall. Uh, President Saunders from Aspen will be joining us again, along with Randy Weingarten, uh, President of the American Federation of Teachers, and Mark uh, Demonstein, President of the American Postal Workers Union. Uh, we will be getting into the Heroes Act. Uh, its value and importance to workers and what we can do uh, to get it passed in this critical time. Well, that ends our fifth episode of Labor Shift. I thank all of you for joining me. Uh, if you can please uh, visit our website, cbtu.org, and take the time to donate to CBTU so we can continue to raise our voice against injustice and for a progressive shift in power. God bless you and good night.